What's up, Goldie here? And I'm going to be going over, let's see, scroll to the side here a little bit, uh, the 10 game main slate here on Monday, May 15. Nice that we have a, a nice full slate here on a Monday. Sometimes we get some of the, uh, the shorter ones, but um, here we are. Um, we've got some interesting spots, as usual. Some early, kind of real chalky spots. Naturally, it, we have Coors Field tonight. Hunter Green and Connor Siebold on the mound. For Cincinnati and Colorado, um, could probably see some offense here tonight uh, in Coors, as we kind of usually do. We do have a, a new starter coming up. I call him new. Um, he, this is uh, Cody Bradford. He's getting called up by the Rangers to make a spot start against Atlanta because DeGrom is still down. Um, we will get into him a little bit when we get to the game. And we've got some other spots that are probably pretty attackable as well. Uh, we might want to get to some Atlanta, of course. Uh, we can get to some Milwaukee. Jack Flaherty's terrible. Um, we can get to, I think, both sides in this Yankees-Toronto game here tonight. Uh, we could play some San Diego, some Arizona, and maybe some sneaky stacks down in the, in the late games as well. So that said, let's just kind of get into it. Um, as I mentioned, we do have some initial pretty chalky pieces on the mound as well, in addition to the Reds, who we'll get to. Um, that being Framber and guys like Merrill Kelly, who gets Oakland. Charlie Morton gets Texas. And kind of filtering then you know, down the list. Naturally, some red numbers here down at the bottom, of course, and guys like Drew Rosinski and Siebel. Um, ownership and, and projections are loaded to the site. Initial looks... Of course, so we look over here to kind of the, the standard deviation columns. Um, we see some red numbers kind of popping pretty hard here uh, in both projections and ownerships. That, so that just gives us an idea that, um, you know, we've got some noise still yet to flesh out with the models and, and the numbers as we uh, as we work through the day. So um, that's kind of uh, where we stand. So let's just get into the first couple of games. And as I mentioned, we'll start with Yankees, the Yankees in Toronto. And we might be able to get some offense here. I don't want to touch Johnny Brito. Now, they haven't officially announced anybody um, either had the Yankees. So it, it <laughs> reason being is because Johnny Brito is getting absolutely torched this season. I have moved a lot of the data over to uh, this year. So we'll have some noise in like the values and, and stuff like that. But um, now with seven, eight starts for a lot of these guys, month and a half into the year, uh, we have some converged figures in in most of these areas. And, and that should give us a good idea. Um, and for Johnny Brito against right-handers, like he's just getting absolutely blasted by the right side of the plate because his slider has been really, really poor as has the fastball mix. The sinker is giving him a little bit of value, as is, I mean, I, as is the changeup, but I guess it's just dead neutral here. Um, so with a lack of, a, of, of any value in uh, really any of the arsenal outside of the two-seamer, which is generally, I mean, certainly not a, a, like a whiff pitch and a strikeout pitch, um, you know, that's going to leave him very vulnerable to a lot of contact. And sure enough, pitching to a full 81.5% here on the barrel at 14% clip with a 10% walk rate, aggregate 16% K rate. And as I mentioned, most of this production coming from right-handers. 292 average, 408 WOBA, and a 339 ISO. That's realized. 282 XBA, 397 X WOBA and a 279 X ISO to both sides of the plate. So um, some pretty concerning numbers, certainly for the Yankees pitching staff here. Uh, so this is why they haven't officially announced him yet. Uh, we'll see what they want to do. Uh, they don't have Severino ready to come back just yet. He only went a couple innings 
in his last rehab start about five, six days ago, but I, they're going to need to to work him out a good bit more before he's ready to come back in the rotation, at which point they'll likely send Johnny Brito down um, or to the bullpen or, or, or something. But uh, this is a very attackable spot for the Blue Jays here. I'd much rather get to them tonight. Um, and in value, despite their very expensive price tags, uh, they're really popping here in the early going. George Springer, 4,600, very good price for him leading off. Um, excellent play there. Now, Bo Bichette, Vladdy, and Matt Chapman, still expensive, 56, 58, 53 for those guys, respectively. Uh, but you've got some cheaper pieces, like a Dalton Varsho. He's 4,600, still playable price. Either of the catchers behind the plate, 32, 3,300, I believe, for Kirk and Danny Jansen. And if you need to get really cheap, you can mix in Brandon Belt, Kiermaier, or Kevin Biggio, something like that. Witt has been stealing a lot of bases, uh, stole four or five bases over the weekend alone. Um, he's 3,900, dual eligibility. You could play him as well. So I'm not worried. I'd rather get to the righties over here, to be honest, um, and instead of the lefties. So I'm not really worried that... The Blue Jays don't have a lot of lefties, but you can mix in Dalton Varsho. It's certainly the plus side of his split. And as we mentioned here, with just a, a marginal changeup and a bad fastball, bad four-seamer, that is, that's going to make him susceptible in the future to giving up more power to opposite-handed hitters as well. So about a neutral ground ball to fly ball, he's going to yield the baseball in the air and a lot of hard contact here. 36% in aggregate is... Uh, Pretty worrisome here for Johnny Brito. So very good spot for the Blue Jays here tonight. Uh, we might be, we'll have to see what the ownership does, um, but we might be able to get them kind of off the board a little bit, but they're popping very hard up in the top f through top four now in value as of right now. So um, really good stack to get to Toronto and their offense kind of rolling a little bit. I believe they just swept the Braves as a matter of fact. So, um, Good value there. However, with Alec Manoa on the other side, on the mound for them, uh, 7,900, I don't think we can get to this tonight. Now, he's going to come in with a little bit of love and 15%, as he kind of normally gets, because historically he's been a very strong suppressor of a lot of production. But as we can see so far this season, I mean, so far, like he's got eight starts. He's only going five and a third per. He's got a 483 ERA with expected metrics pushing six at yeah, north of six uh it's not because of a worrisome strand rate or anything it's because he's walking people he can't throw strikes he doesn't have any of the mechanics that are allowing him to spot these fastballs usually his fastball mix has been pretty damn good with the four seamer two seamer here uh, but he's not getting any value out of the slider no whiffs here either he's not historically a high strikeout pitcher but He's seen his aggregate K rate drop by about four and six ticks here uh, this season. He is having a lot of trouble really finding the strike zone. It's mostly to the left side of the plate so far, 14, 15% walk rate, but pushing 9% to the righties as well. Um, so bad changeup value, bad slider value so far, and really just neutral on the four seamer. Sinker is allowing him to survive, which is why these numbers aren't way, way worse. But big hard contact problem to the left side as well, and that's due to the lack of the changeup. So um, pretty suspect early going here for Alec Manoa. High walk rates, not necessarily on the barrel just yet, but his he's pitching to uh, a few more fly balls this season than he did last year necessarily, and a lot of contact here. He's always been kind of a higher contact pitcher. He's throwing strikes, but he's really having trouble so at an elevated price tag um, and against a lineup over here that I think is heating up. We talked about the Yankees getting a little bit healthier. Uh, Rizzo's really starting to hit the baseball. Of course, he, he's having a kind of a homer barrage at Yankee Stadium. But, um, you know, when you're seeing the baseball, you can certainly – that'll travel, <laughs> definitely. Um, so you can get to some Yankee stacks. Of course, Judge got into a ball, I believe, over the weekend. 6200 very playable price for him. Glaber, price coming down a little bit, uh, at least compared to recent days. He's at 49 now. DJ still at a playable 39. Jake Bowers in the middle of the list. He may lead off again. 
Uh, they led him off, I believe, yesterday. He's at flat 2,000. You can play him for sure. Bader, Volpe, and the filler pieces down at the bo- at the bottom of the lineup are just that filler pieces in stacks if you'd like to get there and attack some. Manoa, historically, like I said, he's a he suppresses pretty well and he can run deep into a game, but he's having trouble throwing strikes here and um, the strikeout stuff has fallen off a cliff. So we don't really want to be dealing with that right now for Manoa, despite the fact that he's likely to get a good bit of run support here. Um, if it is Johnny Brito that they go with, uh, I still don't really want to play him at, at 7,900. If he were 6,900, I probably still wouldn't even consider it given how much uh, he's struggling here in the early going. So really not interested in all in Manoa. I would, I'm probably just going to end up Xing him from my pools, my multi-entry pools for sure. Uh, so I kind of like some offense here, and if you want to get really off the board, it's the Yankees. They're not going to project all that well because teams generally don't against Manoa. But like I said, he's walking everybody here with a full 13% walk rate this season, and that makes him very attackable with full stacks. Okay, let's move on. Seattle and Boston. George Kirby on the mound. Another guy who throws a lot of strikes here. Also kind of struggling a bit with the raw strikeout rate. Um, Now, he's got an excellent fastball mix. He's not having any trouble establishing in counts, but he pitches to so much contact because he throws so many strikes. He has a sub 2% walk rate this season in 44 and two-thirds. This is it. These are elite numbers. Um, are they likely to regress? Probably a little bit, but something like a 3 to 5% walk rate is very sustainable long-term for guys that throw this many strikes. He's having a little bit of trouble eking some value out of certainly the changeup and the slider here a little bit, so the lack of the elite change is going to leave him a little bit vulnerable to the left side, but he's making up all of that value. I mean, he's not throwing this a lot, and as I mentioned, we got a bunch of value noise in the in the pitch values here um, in, in the shorter samples, so we can't take too much out of this, but Kirby has been able to establish and, he, and, and really eke out most of his value. He's throwing these two pitches a full 62% of the time here. So um, you'll get value numbers to converge a little bit faster, certainly with that type of a sample on your fastballs, than you would a, just a 5% mix of a, uh, of a secondary pitch. So um, all that kind of mumbo-jumbo aside, a lot of value coming from the fastballs because he's establishing early in the count, and that allows him to get away with sort of uh, subpar off-speed pitch in, in the changeup and a, a pretty marginal, and a, at least to this point, um, negative value slider. But he's got the excellent curveball as well that he's earning all of this value back with. So effectively, a, a really plus-plus three-pitch mix here in the four-seamer sinker and the curveball. He's got the slider he can use as well. So not really translating into full-on strikeouts because, as I mentioned, he's pitching to so much contact, and he's just around the strike zone. Um, That'll make him a little bit harder to play if he doesn't run super deep into a game. And against Boston here, they're going to make it very difficult because they hit right-handed pitching exceptionally well. 114 WRC plus this season, 19% aggregate strikeout rate with a 191 ISO and a 344 WOBA. Uh, on a line and a very strong spread out and balanced batted ball profile here for the Red Sox, and that's against good righties and against bad righties, of course. Um, how we really want to attack Boston, if we're going to go after them with a an above-average right-hander like Kirby, you really need some whiff stuff and some strong K stuff, and Kirby just doesn't quite have that because he throws so many strikes. Um, So I think I'd have to probably side with the offense here in Boston against Kirby. I'm not wild about the price tag. If he were 8,400, I'd I'd be much more excited about this, and I would probably look to force him into my tournament pools. Um... At the moment, not projecting very well. Certainly very low for a guy up at this price tag. And his ownership is naturally uh, well under 5% because of that. So um, it makes him a fine tournament play because he does still... Having... uh, Since he's able to throw so many strikes, I should say, 
it allows him to get really quick outs, and he can stay down in the strike zone uh, with certainly against right-handers. Buck 50 ground ball to fly ball, fly ball, really good number. Very high soft contact rate, 33% against the right side. No hard contact whatsoever, and the, the numbers against lefties are just as good. So everything here is, is perfectly fine. Um, if you want to play him in, or if you land on him in some deeper tournament stuff, at this ownership, he's got upside at this price tag for sure. In this particular matchup, it's it's a di very difficult spot, uh, of course. So I think I just have to kind of by default side with the offense. Um, that doesn't mean I really want to play them necessarily. I think I'd probably prefer to get to Devers if I'm playing anybody. I think we're probably seeing a little bit of a price inversion between he and Yoshida, who is 5,500. Um, Devers 54, I think, I mean, he's very clearly the best hitter on the team. Verdugo up at 5,000, not super thrilled about that in this particular matchup either. 3,600 for Justin Turner, doesn't really have a lot of upside anymore. Jaron Duran, 39, his price kind of coming up, and he strikes out a crap load. Uh, Tristan Casas does as well. So not my favorite offense to get to for Boston. They're popping in the betting markets uh, in, terms of, in terms of expected run total, and that's because... Kirby pitches to so much contact. So it's very reasonable that Boston, being very good against righties, could get there. I think you can play both sides here. If I had to choose, I I just side with the offense. Um, but don't be shocked if Kirby uh, picks apart this offense here a little bit. This is a good arm over here, and he throws a lot of strikes. And if you've got good fastball command um, with multiple pitches, I mean, that's just a boon. Like, it... You can survive uh, a, even against very, very good lineups. Uh, Tanner Houck on the mound for the Red Sox. 8100 for him. I'm not interested at this, at this price tag. Uh, I'm not super thrilled with a lot of the arsenal. He does have a good bit of, at least in the early going here in this short sample, 37 and two-thirds of the season, a good bit of value coming from the, the two-seamer and the cutter. Um, yeah, just kind of marginal so far with the four-seamer. Good value out of the slider so far, throwing it a lot, but really not getting a lot of whiffs from the splitter. And that's what's leading to some of the power to left-handers and a little bit more of the contact. The off-speed pitch just doesn't um, have quite the, the whiff rate that you need on this type of pitch to neutralize a lot of opposite-handed power. So um, really not yielding a lot of value yet for him. If he dials this down, this could very well just be noisy. I don't have total number of pitches here in the, in the sheet or anything. Um, but like I said, we're only dealing with the 86 hitter sample. He's probably only thrown, I don't know, uh, maybe a guess, like 40 splitters to a lefty, um, if it's even that high. So, you know, certainly some noise still. Um, he's also at very low ownership, but at, at an elevated price tag, He's just at a 20% K rate himself. So we're also seeing elevated run total pop in the betting markets for Seattle on the other side. Um, now, I think if I had to choose, I would probably side with Tanner Houck here instead of full Seattle stacks. And that's because of the plus slider value and the plus sinker cutter combination that'll allow him to really get off the field against right-handers and neutralize a lot of the power there. So he's going to be able to induce more soft contact and really stay off of the barrel against right-handers. And most of the good hitters from Seattle are hitting from the right side of the plate. Of course, Ty France, Julio, Gino Suarez, Tay Oscar, he's been dreadful. Um, they're all hitting from the right side. They've got some lefties like a Jared Kelnick, who's probably been their best hitter all season. Cal Raleigh from the left side of the plate. We like him against righties generally, but he's at 4,500. Um, expensive for a catcher piece down in the six or, or wherever they throw him. A couple other lefties, Taylor Trammell. He's got pop, fly ball hitter there. Uh, I think that's fine, 2,700. Colton Wong, though, has also been quite disappointing to start his Mariners tenure. Uh, 2,300 second base. He's cheap, and you can make a full Mariner stack happen here, but... Once again, Tanner Houck's going to be able to navigate, I think, the right-handers a pretty good bit with a, a respectable fastball mix and a fine, and to this point, plus value slider. If he's really got this biting, he could pick through Seattle over here pretty easily. They've been very underwhelming against right-handers all season. 
just a 98 WRC plus average in every single metric and below average in the K rate at, at 25%. So how could I think pop a little bit here on the plus side of a strikeout variance? Um, I'm still not super thrilled about paying 8,100 for him, but at very low ownership, I think this is a, a reasonable consideration in tournaments. Um, he has 20, 22, 25 out of him. If he could squeeze out a win, he could he could eke out 25 points here. And I don't think that is totally out of the question. Uh, we'll probably have maybe some uh, some depth concerns for him. but and, and that would mostly take me off of him. But I think this is a fine, deep tournament play. I'm not thrilled, of course, with the raw strikeout rate. But he's got a high ground ball rate. And that'll allow him to run deeper into a baseball game if he's really got this slider biting. Uh, and he can establish with the two-seamer two seamer in the cutter and really stay off of the barrel with the four-seamer. So I think it's a reasonable consideration here to get to a little bit. But, I mean, we're not getting him at 5,400 like we did a few weeks ago against the Twins. Uh, he's 81 now. And overall, he's just kind of, a, um, kind of an underwhelming upside arm. But overall, I think this is an intriguing game. You can play pretty much all sides here, I think. Uh, would have to side with the offenses naturally because these guys just pitched a lot of contact in general. Um, but you could play the arms on the mound for sure. Okay, Milwaukee and the Cardinals. We're definitely not going to be playing uh, Jack Flaherty. Well, at least I'm not. I, we'll get to him in a sec. Freddie Peralta on the mound for the Brewers. Probably not going to be playing him either. 9000 here. I'm not super jacked about this price tag. And the Cardinals' offense, still very good. And now you're getting Aaron Otto to heat up. Um, when all of these guys start clicking, I mean, look out, because this offense is going to be one of the best in, in baseball. Still making a lot of hard contact here in aggregate, 35.5%, highest number on the day, I believe, split adjusted, 112 WRC+, plus, 21% strikeout rate with a 172 ISO. That's climbing a little bit um, over the... I mean, and we're talking 1,200 PA. It's not easy to make all these numbers climb anymore. So still going up. They're still putting up a lot of runs. Coming off a really good series are the Cardinals. Um, I'm not super interested in going after this offense when it's really clicking. Uh, they're very difficult to strike out when they're all really clicking. Goldschmidt's only got... You know, 23% K rate, I believe, against right-handers. Uh, Aaron Otto only strikes out at 18, 19% clip. Uh, Lars at the top of the lineup, pretty sticky as well. 4,200, you can play him. Dolan Gorman got a lot of pop from the left side, of course. Dual eligibility, once again, at second and third. You could play him at 4,300. Wilson Contreras behind the plate, probably not my favorite there. But he's 42, and you could play him in stacks. Donovan uh, or... Some of the filler pieces down at the bottom of the lineup, Paul DeYoung has had a, a decent start to the season for him. Still cheap. Alec Burleson's got pop as well, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think I'd rather get to some of the Cardinals here than Freddie, although at it, like at depressed ownership, I, I like pray, playing Freddie in what could be or what is generally perceived as a bad matchup. This is certainly one of those. Um but we're not really getting him at you know completely off the board. We're seeing you know 18, 20 percent ownership come in on Freddie at the moment, and that really kind of takes me off. I think that's it's a pretty high variance spot for, admittedly, what's a a really high upside strikeout arm, but um, you know kind of an elevated price tag and not all that enthusiastic am I uh, really about going after the Cardinals when their offense is really rolling um, now Freddie I do like going after them with guys that have a lot of high high whiff stuff and, and Freddie certainly has that um, but the walks are kind of starting to creep up a little bit here at least in in this short 41 inning sample this season 11 percent to the left side not so much to the righties but they're going to be able to throw some lefties against him will the Cardinals um, so he could have some susceptibility here with what in the early going looks like a pretty marginal secondary offering here. Four seamer still very, very good, and he'll be able to establish. And if he's on the plus side of the variance, curveball has historically been very good as well. Uh, slider also. Um, if he's on the plus side of the variance here with uh, with these pitches and feeling them tonight, he can absolutely pick through the Cardinals. I'm not sure I want to get him 
in 20% of my teams. Uh, probably end up coming in under at this particular figure, but uh, I think it's it's reasonable to, um, you know, certainly not X out of your pools completely. The swing strike stuff is still there, and the raw K rate itself is, of course, still there. So I think he's a fine play. Um, and I think you could probably consider playing both sides. You get a little bit of leverage playing some of the Cardinals here. Now, they're not going to pop in in value or projections for you very hard. Um, so you'd probably have to force these in. But getting a little bit of leverage on what could be a slightly vulnerable walk rate here uh, with Freddie and pitching to a lot of contact in a hot offense, um, I think that's uh, I, I think it's a reasonable play. Um, on the other side, here's Flaherty. I'm just not playing him at 76. Are you still, still got a 15% walk rate this season? Um, I don't, I don't know who he's blaming over here, but the, like the problem was not the guy behind the plate calling pitches or whatever. It's, it's execution of the pitches and the entire arsenal outside of the slider has really been bad. It's kind of a, a slider cutter hybrid pitch here for Flaherty. And that's the only thing that's allowed him to survive and his last couple outings, he's not been able to survive. Um, he gave up, uh, let's see, he gave up the 10 runs against the, who was it? The angels, right? Um, and then in his last outing against the Cubs strikeout stuff still wasn't there. Walked five batters, did go five innings, but gave up three runs, walked five guys, sprayed seven hits. Like, so Still just way too much variance for Flaherty, and I think 15% is like a gift in terms of being able to play the Brewers on the other side. If this number comes in here with Flaherty at 14%, like, no thank you. I'm not going near this. Um, I think the Walker is a major, major problem. I don't like any of the Arsenal here. He's got a bad four-seamer that he's throwing way too much. And he has no change-up. So it's really just slider cutter value. Curveball has been bad, so I'm not going near it. He can't throw any of this stuff for strikes, and he's on the barrel at a full 12% clip here. 177x ISO is an attackable figure with a 375x Woba, 263x BA here. So um, a lot of hard contact, north of 30% to both sides. Homers to the lefties, uh, 236 realized ISO to the left side. I'm just I'm not dealing with this. This is uh, this looks horrific. Uh, pretty much on every level outside of that good slider value. Um, and the the Brewers here, they've been pretty, I mean, maybe not uh, not dynamite, but uh, pretty damn respectable, I would say, against the right side of the plate where they've been dreadful against the lefties, of course. But against the righties, um, or from the right side, of the plate against lefties, they've been they've been awful. Uh, against right handers on the mound, Still walking a lot of, at a full 10% clip. This is a big aggregate number for a team here, and we talked about Flaherty's walk rate. Um, 31% hard contact. He's going to be able to exploit some of that, um, or the, the Brewers are going to be able to exploit some of that vulnerability and Flaherty down there. So I don't see how there's value or an exploitable spot for Jack Flaherty here, which means 15% ownership for him seems completely crazy it's like totally asinine um for a team that doesn't really strike out against right handers and right just an aggregate 22 and a half percent carry this offense really kind of humming as well of course they had the royals over the weekend but i mean they're still hitting for buck 61 iso here 326 woba themselves and and a good bit of hard, hard contact as i mentioned so i i want the brewers here um, and maybe some correlated teams with some Freddie. I think that's perfectly viable. Um, Milwaukee coming in here at about uh, sixth or so in, in ownership so far. So I think this is an off the board kind of stack a little bit with a lot of upside and very playable price tags for all of these guys. Yelich's power is really starting to show up again. He's been hitting the ball hard all season and now it's starting to go over the wall. He's also running a good bit. He's got like nine bags this season too. So in, in the first month and a half, uh, that's a lot of value. Jesse Winker is, is terrible, um, and they're actually DHing him, but pinch hitting for him later in the game when they bring in a lefty. Um, he's just been awful. So unfortunately, even at 2,800, he's <laughs> kind of hard to play. But the rest of the 
entire lineup is is very playable. I'd rather play Willie Contreras behind the plate over here than Wilson uh, on the other side. Rowdy's fine at 44, and you can s still play uh, Willie Adamas. 42 hits right. He's okay. Um, cheaper guys down at the lineup if you need them. So give me the Brewers here pretty much exclusively. Some Freddy pieces, definitely. And maybe a little bit of the Cardinals as a really off-the-board stack just for some leverage if that ownership number gets too high on Freddy. Okay, Atlanta and Texas. Uh, Charlie Morton on the mound for them. Uh, for the Braves, that is. 8,500. Seen a lot of ownership early at 25%. And I think you can get to some leverage Texas stacks here too. Now, they're not popping all that heavily in, in in raw projection so far. But this is a damn good baseball team against righties. They strike out a little bit, 23.5% sure, but they still create 114 WRC+. plus. Also, very similar to the Cardinals, 35% hard contact rate and a 183 ISO. They're basically identical teams against right-handed pitching, even though I mean, the Rangers strike out about two clicks more. So all these numbers very similar, and I don't want to go after that really either because I'm not super impressed with Charlie Morton and the Arsenal here, certainly this season, as we've talked about in his last couple of starts, he's moved more and more of the usage over to the curveball, which is great. It's still his best pitch, and he's still got plenty of value and plenty of whiffs on that pitch, but everything else is terrible, uh, yielding a lot of value here to the field. Four-seamer, change-up mix is bad. Sinker's been terrible, and really, you know, not throwing the slider a lot, but not getting value there either. So uh, certainly a noisy sample. Um and 40 and two thirds here, but 200 hitters, 200 hitters. And, you know, the guy's just got one pitch. So uh, I know he, he took apart Boston. And when I alluded to pitchers that we want to play against teams like Boston, um, I was thinking about Charlie Morton. He's got some strikeout stuff, at least to the left side of the plate. Uh, not so much to the righties. He's still giving up power to the lefties, 186 ISO. And 38% hard contact, 34% hard contact to the right side. So the strikeout rate and the hard contact are in going in opposite directions here for um, for Charlie against righties. And despite the whiffs against lefties, in aggregate, this drops him down to about a 22% aggregate K rate. It's nowhere near the 27 28% that he's been in the last couple of seasons. So I think there's a blow-up coming soon for Charlie here and at very high ownership I'm not sure I want to be going after one of the best lineups in baseball against right-handed pitching in the Texas Rangers um, now on the mound for them they've got as we mentioned earlier Cody Bradford they're calling up pitch mix here is uh, four seamer change mix and I believe he's got a curveball as well um, he really only has about 11 and a half percent swinging strike rate in the upper minors this season and as I mentioned, is just making a spot start with DeGrom still out. He's got an 086 whip, so really good control. It doesn't pitch to a hell of a lot of contact, um, but perhaps a little bit noisy in the raw suppression metrics. He has an 091 ERA in seven starts down, or excuse me, yeah, seven starts um, down in AAA this season with a 520 XFIP. So a uh, little, um, little bit of noise coming through in the numbers there. Uh, as I mentioned, just an 11.5% swinging strike rate for him in the upper minors. Uh, homer to fly ball rate is is 2.5%, and normal in the bigs is uh, way, way higher than that. It's north of 10 and pushing 12 and 13%. So, um, like I said, walk rate is, is strong at, at 9% or so. K rate is okay in the upper minors at 25%, but you need to see this pushing and north of 30 for that to translate to really high whiff stuff uh, when you get to this level. And I don't think he's going to be able to, I mean, certainly we can't play him because he's not in the DK player pool. Um, but does that mean we want to fade the Braves necessarily? I don't think the arsenal and the batter ball profile is going to look good enough to make me want to do that. Uh, they're going to be expensive though. So if you can make this happen, yeah, by all means, you're going to have to make some decisions elsewhere to fit these guys in Acuna 63 Olsen 55 don't leave him out of stack here uh 51 for Riley 5k for Sean Murphy and 48 for Albies cheaper guys down at the bottom of the lineup you're gonna have to mix in some Marcelo Zuno unfortunately at 2600 Kevin Pillar 2800 
Uh, Michael Harris, you could play him still as well, 35, or in Orlando Arcia at shortstop, 36. He has lefties very well. So a uh, good change up plus, plus change here. Um, and he could neutralize some of the righties a little bit. And that might take me off of some of the Braves here, just at their price tags. So you could get away with fading in Atlanta because of that. He's stretched out. He's a starter down here. It's not like he's only going to go two or three innings or something. Um, so he could navigate with a four-seamer and a good change-up mix. It's very possible, but uh, I don't really want to be um, dealing with that against Atlanta. So I would almost certainly just side with them. Um, now, as far as value score, they're not going to pop really at all. They're going to pop a little bit in ownership, of course, because they're getting a young lefty, and uh, Atlanta always gets played. But um, you know, probably one, two, three, four, five, sixth on the board now, or something in in ownership. Um, we'll see how that fleshes out throughout the day. So another off the board kind of uh, unowned stack that you could consider getting to over here in Atlanta with a lot of upside. They've got all the upside in the world, of course. Offense may be a little cold. They did just get swept in Toronto, I believe. So um, you got that going against you, but it's kind of it's kind of uh, whatever. You know, I'm not. I mean, this is Atlanta. We're gonna, we're gonna be interested in playing them literally every slate. So uh, I want to get to some offense here. I'm probably off of the Charlie Morton, um, and and who knows? It it may bite me again. But uh, I would rather get leverage as this ownership number starts to steam a little bit. Uh, everybody in the mid-range, really seeing a lot of ownership here in the mid-8K range. Um, and I think we can get to some leverage spots uh, and, and play some offenses against them. Um, okay, let's move on. Chicago and Houston. Jamison Tyon on the mound, 7,500. I mean, maybe maybe we send guys out on rehab starts uh, before just bringing them back after three weeks off or, or whatever it was. Um, after they've been hurt, because Tyon has been blasted in his last two starts, gave up seven earned and gave up three earned or four earned or something um, in his last two appearances. And it, it, it's been, um, you know, really difficult for him to kind of establish a, a rhythm this season. Now, we see some pretty noisy figures here. About half the sample is all of these other guys. So not going to be able to take a lot out of this so far. Uh, but Tyon is, is generally a, a pretty neutral splits kind of guy to both sides of the plate. He'll give it up a little bit more to the lefties. Um, and he certainly doesn't have a 36% strikeout rate to the right side. Now, 42 hitters is a, a pretty small sample here. Um, but he's gotten a lot of good value out of the curveball so far here. And as we talk about, usually the, the stinker is not... Uh, a whip pitch, nor is the cutter. So um, not getting any value out of the slider. So it's really mostly just coming from the curveball, And it's a super short sample against right-handers. So uh, it's definitely not this high. Um, but in 19 and two-thirds, you know, 28% is 28%. He's throwing a lot of strikes. So that's good and encouraging. But this is not who Tyon is. These numbers will regress quite a bit. Uh, and despite the fact that Houston has been pretty underwhelming against righties this season, certainly striking out a lot more, 23.5%. This is probably the highest number we've seen from them in the last six, eight years uh, in aggregate for a team. 83 WRC+, plus, they're still like second in the division down here or whatever. So, um, you know, they're still able to win baseball games and, and create cr create enough to kind of survive here until they get all their guys healthy like a... Josie Altuve, Michael Brantley, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so one to just a 114 ISO for the Strohs so far. Is it reasonable that you could get, land on a Jameson Tyon at 7,500 at mega low ownership and he could survive for five innings, strike out six or seven, be on the plus side of this strikeout variance against the righties? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think it makes him an intriguing tournament play. Uh, I'm not going to go out of my way to do this, but if I land on a few Jamison Tyon teams, I'm probably not going to exit, I don't think. Um, I usually don't like going after the Astros, even if they have been underwhelming. And if I do it, it's with a guy that's got, excuse me, historically very high strikeout stuff. And Tyon is not that guy. So um, probably, I mean, certainly not a favorite. I'd, I'd like to get to... Maybe some Astros pieces from the left side of the plate. Jordan Alvarez, Kyle Tucker. I think they're both playable at 6K, 5,200. 
uh, right in the middle of the lineup. Alex Bregman doesn't strike out a lot. Uh, Mo Dubon doesn't strike out a lot either. So these couple of guys at the top of the lineup are going to make it pretty difficult for Tyon to establish uh, and work his way down through to the guys at the bottom of the lineup who will strike out Jeremy Pena uh, and the younger hitters, Corey Jolks or, or a Chaz or, or some of these guys. That will K. So not my favorite getting to him, but if you land on him at a very low ownership figure here, I think it's probably okay for him to pop to 23, 25 points or something like that. I think it's it's all right. Uh, Framber on the mound for the Astros, 10-7 for him. Um, seeing heavy ownership on him this slate when we only saw about, what, sub-5% on him last in his last start. Uh, no problems with this, really. Uh, he, he's going to pop the hardest in, in projection, and the ownership number is going to follow, right? So having trouble establishing with the changeup a little bit, but the, the fastball, slider, curveball mix are keeping him so far down in the strike zone that he can get away with negative value realized on a, a third or you know third secondary offering uh, because his ground ball rate is just so high. 3.3 to both sides of the plate in aggregate, 2.5 ground ball to fly ball to the lefties and 3.5 to the righties. Uh, so he's giving up a little bit of production here, but only seven and a third and 30 hitters in this sample here for Frambar. Framber against uh, lefties this season. So we're not worried about this. He is elite against the left side of the plate. Um, this is just noise. So 095 ISO and 180 hitters against righties. Everybody tries to platoon against him, and it just doesn't work, right? So he'll give up some hard contact, yeah, but when he's got a three and a half ground ball to fly ball rate, 64% with a sub 20% line drive rate. Um, I mean, we don't really care how, how hard, uh, they're hitting the baseball against him. If it's all on the ground and right at people. So it doesn't translate into homers. Oh, 60 homers per nine. Oh, 95 ISO, no extra base hits either. And still has a 27% K rate to the right side as well this year. So, um, in aggregate, buck 50 X ISO, 251 XBA, and a 303 X Woba. These are all fine numbers, 27% aggregate K rate. So uh, nothing wrong with Framber here, and we can go after the Cubs because they've been terrible. Uh, a couple other guys may be heating up a little bit. Say Suzuki hit a bomb finally. Uh, he's down to 3,900. Not like I want to play any of these guys. I I don't stack against Framber. It's just so rare that he gets blown up. Um so no thank you on any of the Cubs, and that really means that we can get to a good bit of Framber. Uh, it's just lineup construction and pr managing the price tag here and the ownership that you're really going to have to worry about. But I prefer mostly the Astros here and getting to uh, certainly some Jordan and some Kyle Tucker pieces. If you want to fill out some shorter stacks with a Bregman uh, or a Beau Dumont, cheaper piece that at the top of the lineup, I think that's fine as well. But if you want to land on a couple of time pieces here. I don't think this is totally crazy. Okay, let's move on. Cincy and, and the Rockies. Um, Hunter Green on the mound for Cincinnati. 8300 I think it's an intriguing price tag, to be quite honest. Uh, I really love the K stuff for him. Uh, I do not like how much contact he pitches to, to the right side of the plate in particular. It's with a vulnerable four-seamer and a pretty average slider here. And really, these are the only two pitches. Really surprising. It, it's only because he's throwing 100 miles an hour uh, with a l pretty okay changeup. He doesn't throw this a lot. He needs to develop this pitch, and he needs to do it, like, pronto. Otherwise, he's going to be he's gonna end up in the bullpen, or they're going to have to send him down to the minors. Um, he just gives up too much hard contact to the right side of the plate. 35% with a 224 ISO. And 329 average allowed to righties this season, 86 hitters. I mean, th these numbers... This isn't just short sample noise or anything. These numbers were the exact same for him last year as well. So um, the control is is generally fine. 9% walk rate, you know, 8.5, whatever. No problems there. Um, but it's really just getting on the barrel with the, with the four-seamer here and hard contact, really, to both sides of the plate. So um, he's throwing a Coors Field, and you can play the Rockies. Now, you got to keep an eye on them because they lost C.J. Crone yesterday. He's probably going to be out with back spasms. Probably see a DL stint for him. Um, rest of the offense kind of heating up a little bit. Have had, have won a lot of games recently, and really, at this point of the season, you kind of have to be excited 
that the Rockies are only seven games under 500, um, despite having 26 different injuries in their starting rotation and the offense, for the most part, being pretty underwhelming. Uh, they're going to have Moose in the lineup, Mike's, Mike Moustakas. He's at a playable price tag, uh, 3100 or 3200 something like that. Uh, he's playable. Uh, you can play some of these righties, though. Chris Bryant and Elias Diaz would be my uh, preferred pieces there. You can play Jerry Profar at 4000 Charlie Blackman's been really cold. Uh, he's 4800 elevated price tag, but... Um, you know, you could certainly play him in stacks. Colorado, not going to be super off the board, but they're really only about top six in ownership at, at the moment right now, too. So I think you play both sides here. Uh, you can certainly play Ryan McMahon really starting to heat up is McMahon. 4,500, much more playable price tag now that he's seeing the baseball better. Um, you have to see what they do down at the bottom of the lineup, given that they're going to be missing Crone. They'll have to make a DH decision today or something. But uh, I think the Rockies are a playable stack, and I also think Hunter Green, with the high K stuff, got, like, guy's throwing 100. Um, even if he is pitching to a lot of hard contact, I mean, he's throwing 100 miles an hour, and the Rockies still strike out against pretty much everybody. Now, against righties this season, a little less so. 23% in aggregate, every pretty average in most every other metric. Not hitting for a lot of power. So, um, now, they're, they are at Coors Field, and this... Coors Field number, this WRC plus, uh, will rise because they're at Coors Field. So, um, in it, in general, I think it's fine playing both sides here. And if I had to choose, I'd probably like to play Hunter Green. Um, and at very low ownership, I think this is fine. But if he only goes, you know, five innings, gives up a couple runs here, I wouldn't be too shocked. Connor Siebold on the mound for the Rockies, 5,300. Um, he's going to, he's, got to be in the rotation for him because they've got three injuries. Uh, Senza is out. Um, Noah Davis is out, as is Herman Marquez. So they don't really have any other guys. And they have just brought up, uh, I believe, Riley Pint, uh, who was a high upside prospect, draft pick for them a couple of years ago. Finally going to make his debut eventually. Um but 5,300 on the mound for Siebold, I, I, I don't think we can we can play this. He's had good fastball command uh, in the couple of starts so far, but this is mostly a bullpen guy. Now, Colorado's bullpen has been very good, as a matter of fact. Uh, far, far better than they have been in previous seasons. But they've had to eat a lot of innings recently, and same thing is probably going to happen with Connor Siebold here today. He has gone five innings in each of his last two, uh, this doesn't mean you can play him, of course, but he could suppress and run a little bit deeper, and that would allow Colorado to get to the plus side of their bullpen, like a Jake Burr, Daniel Bard. These guys have been, uh, Justin Lawrence, very, very strong coming out of the bullpen so far. Um, and if they only have to run about an inning each or something, that could allow them to suppress. We've seen them do this to some teams, even at Coors Field, like the Phillies, most notably, um, the Brewers for sure. They can they can survive, and their their bullpen's been very good. Uh, on the slate here today, they've been averaged in pretty much every metric, including xFIP, ERA, hard contact, uh, all this sort of stuff. So, um, Connor Seabold is only going to go probably about four or five innings or so. That's probably about his upside, so you can't play him, of course. And we can definitely get to the Reds, still Coors Field, and all these guys are still too cheap outside of Johnny India at 5600 This is probably the one place where it's okay to be playing Johnny India at this price tag, is at Coors Field. Tyler Stevenson up to 48 uh, Some of the power starting to show up for Stevenson. That's nice to see. But every one of these other guys, Jake Fraley is way too cheap at 4200 He should be 5200 uh, Spencer Steer, 34 Senzel is at 45, but this is a good, good hitter, man. When he is healthy, uh, he was a high, high upside prospect for them. He just hadn't been able to stay healthy. Now that he is, I think there's a lot of value at, at 4,500 for sure. Uh, we'll have to see what they want to do at the bottom of the lineup. They did call up a high upside hit tool prospect for them, Matt McLean. He'll be in there at shortstop tonight. He's the stone minimum. So a uh, lot of ownership going to come to the Reds naturally, and you're just going to have to balance that for um, – how you want to build your team. So you can make all of this happen, but once again, you're going to have to get to the Reds. It's They're just underpriced, and it's a good spot because Seabold down here 
he's trying to throw a full three pitches, but the slider's really been getting blasted. It's going to make him susceptible to the right side, and the changeup's been bad so far, too. Um, even in his very noisy sample coming out of the bullpen and in his couple of starts here. So um, not a lot in the arsenal to really work with. So he's attackable with uh, with both sides of the plate here, uh, righties and lefties. So you can play a lot of the reds. You just got to balance the ownership. Okay, Arizona and Oakland. Um, 8,800 for Merrill Kelly on the mound. He's going to be very chalky today. And unfortunately, uh, I like jumping off the train when Merrill Kelly is very chalky. Um, I'm much more inclined to play him when he's chalky than somebody like a Blake Snell uh, or something like that because I think he's just a far better arm and he's got six pitches and he doesn't walk people a whole hell of a lot now this season he's having a little bit of trouble in this short sample here with the control to the right side of the plate 15 percent walk rate it's notable 88 hitters is it's a notable sample here but the production is Still pretty damn good. 216 average to the righties, 320 Woba, and a buck 62 ISO. He's been fantastic against lefties because the cutter changeup mix really keeping him down in the strike zone and getting a lot of whiffs here. Curveball's been great too. Um, it's the four seamer that he's really battling with in terms of command. When he establishes plus value on this four seamer, like the pitch mix is just elite. Um, it doesn't really translate so much into raw whiffs. This is actually about three and four ticks higher than his seasonal averages of a year ago. So this is encouraging, even though he's pitching to a good bit more hard contact. These are worrisome figures, definitely. So if you want to come off of some of the high ownership of Merrill Kelly against Oakland, I mean, this is Oakland, don't get me wrong. They're bad and very attackable because they strike out. But look here at a 92 WRC+. plus. This team is not as bad as one would assume a 26% K rate would suggest. Buck 50 ISO, 298 Woba, not a lot of hard contact necessarily, but the contact they're going to make, it's going to be on a line and in the air here at an 094 ground ball to fly ball. So... They do strike out, and they won't hit for a lot of average, of course, so that makes them very attackable. But when they get guys on base, they're creating, and that's mostly with Estiri Ruiz at the top of the lineup. 3,600, he gets on. He's going to move, man, and he's going to steal bases. Makes it very difficult on opposing starters because now you got to deal with guys in runners, uh, deal with guys in scoring position. So they're able to create here a little bit over here. Um, is Oakland, so I don't think it's totally crazy if you go after some Merrill Kelly and try and build some leverage teams here with uh, a Ryan Noda who's very cheap, Brent Rooker who's got plenty of pop, JJ Blade, Ramon Laureano, Jace Peterson, Shea Langoliers all have pop. Now this is in Oakland, and it's a huge ballpark over here. Um, I would definitely just side with Merrill Kelly because he's a better arm and he can pick through this lineup no problem, but I think this is where you start in cash, for sure. In tournaments, I think you can get off of this at 30% ownership, and you can go elsewhere in the mid-range, or you can get different on the mound and get to some chalky red stacks like you might want to do. So uh, I think it's very reasonable to actually consider some Oakland stacks here tonight. Probably short stacks because it's Oakland and they're bad. But there are pieces here like a Ruiz, Rooker, J.J. Blade that make it very cheap, allow you to get to a Framber and a Reds or something like that. Uh, I think it's very viable if you want to leverage some of this high ownership on Merrill. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I love Merrill, and I'm probably going to end up playing him quite a bit here. Maybe not a full 30%. Maybe come in a little bit under the field, in tournaments at least. In cash, I think that's just where you start. Drew Rusinski on the mound for them. We still just can't play this. Um, the strikeout rate is 8% since coming over from the KBO, where he had a 24 and 25% strikeout rate. Now, of course... The, the whiff stuff is, is not going to translate from the KBO to the bigs, but certainly didn't expect it to be this much of a drop-off. Um, this is, what, a 75% drop-off or 66 or something? Like, ugh, he's not throwing it past anybody, and he's throwing to an 84% contact rate here. Uh, we can't go near this, even at 5,000. Against D-backs... And the D-back's going to pop pretty hard in ownership and in value for, for us here today. And you can get to pretty much every one of them. Uh, Josh Rojas, 46 at the top of the lineup, second and third base eligible. Really like that price. Ketel Marte at 5,000, that's fine too. Corbin Carroll down to 52 now. Um, is it is a good ballpark for him. He could hit one in a gap and run forever. 
Lourdes is fine at 39, 45 for Christian Walker. That's okay as well. He's got the most pop on the team. We'll see what they want to do down at the bottom of the lineup with their outfielders. But Dom Fletcher is almost certainly going to be in the lineup again. He's been seeing the baseball great. He's got an OPS pushing 1,200 or something here in the early going. Um, 2,400 for him. That's perfectly playable. Jerry Perdomo at shortstop has cooled off a little bit, but you can run some nice wraparound stacks if you need to consider some ownership here. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Gabby Moreno behind the plate, cheap catcher piece. So we can definitely get to some Arizona. I like fully correlated teams. Uh, would side with the offense if I had to choose, but uh, between Merrill Kelly and, and the D-backs offense. But uh, we don't have to choose, so we can play all of it. So uh, give me a lot of the D-backs, maybe a little bit of Oakland too, but uh, no Rusinski. Okay, let's get to KC and San Diego. Um, 7,300 on the mound for Brad Keller. We can't do this either. His walk rate is 18% still this season. Uh, he just can't throw strikes, and normally I don't like stacking against Brad, Kel against Brad Keller. It's because he doesn't give up homers. Still not giving up homers. 0.68 homers per nine this season, but the variance with him, in, it skyrockets when you put people on base for free, and that makes stacks much more viable. 51, 52% strike one rate is egregious, and I don't know what he's lost here, but uh, maybe a victim of the pitch clock. He's been sped up a little bit, um, and it, it's really kind of torched his mechanics, and, and he's totally lost the release point. He can't spot this cutter at all. Sinker is still okay, keeping him down in the strike zone, as is the slider, um, but he's it's the walks that are the problem for him. It's not necessarily the arsenal. Can't really spot the cutter here. That will help him throw more strikes, but he's he's throwing it to the freaking backstop. Like, I mean, if you watch this guy pitch, it is kind of painful to watch. So uh, I'm not going near this, even at 7,300, um, certainly against Padres. Uh, we can get to them as well. They're going to pop pretty hard. Coming in in ownership, actually right now, uh, second in aggregate ownership are the Padres. Uh, but you can get to them definitely. And it, it, it's, this Walker is just way too high for Brad Keller, and he just doesn't seem to be able to fix it. So you can play every single one of the Padres, top to bottom. I personally will probably try to stay off of Trent Grisham. He's terrible. Um, but outside of that, I like pretty much everybody in the lineup because you're going to need some of these cheaper pieces like Ahasan Kim. He's at 2,900. This is a good play here. He's getting second and shortstop eligibility. Um, that's a very workable piece. Matt Carpenter, probably the best raw batted ball play here because Keller has such a high ground ball rate still. Um, so you're going to need guys that are going to be able to get it on the line and in the air. That's a Juan Soto. That's Cronenworth. That's Carp from the left side of the place, plate at least. And you can still play a Tatis and Machado and a Xander Bogart. So uh, Machado pretty cold right now at the plate. So maybe a little expensive given how cold he's been. Uh, I had a really rough series against Dodgers. But everybody else, including him, I mean, they're all at very playable price tags. Um, so I, I like getting to a good bit of the Padres here. No Brad Keller. You can play some Royals, though, against Waka. I don't believe in any of this with Waka. Um, 7,800 on the mound for him. Sure, might he be able to survive? But it, his historically best pitch is the changeup, and he's not getting any value out of that whatsoever. Flat neutral here on the change, and the Royals over here have some pretty damn good lefties. You'd like to probably play... Pretty often, Vinny Pascantino, 4,200, still playable. He should be like 47, 4,800, I think, at a minimum. Uh, MJ is 37, lost his catcher eligibility with Freddie Furman having been called up, but still hitting in the middle of the lineup in the four hole in the outfield. That's perfectly fine. Nick Prado still has his dual eligibility at first in the outfield. 2,800 there for him. Really strong from the left side of the plate, but you can get to righties as well because even this season in 100 hitters, Michael Walker still giving up 181 ISO and a 16% strikeout rate to the right side of the plate. So there's a lot of contact here against Walker. He's got high ownership right now. I think you can get to some leverage Royal stacks as well. They're cheap and playable, and it'll allow you to get to pretty much whoever the hell else you want. So um, I'm not excited about Michael Walker here at a 
kind of a fishy price tag, I think, and elevated ownership, even though the projection is popping a little bit. And this is the Royals, don't get me wrong. They're going to strike out a 24% clip against righties and only create at an 81 WRC+. plus. But they make a lot of hard contact, man, 35% in aggregate, and they hit the baseball in the air. So I'm not, I'm not interested with Waka here with a marginal changeup. He's not going to be able to neutralize any value that the left-handers are going to provide to the Royals lineup over here. 241 ISO so far. He's got a 207 aggregate X ISO, and that's not a good number. Uh, a lot of fly balls here. Good bit of hard contact to both sides of the plate, pushing 30% each. So I'm not interested in, in the Michael Waka shenanigans. Uh, I'd rather just get to mostly offense here in this game. Maybe I'd have a, a share or two of Waka, but it's certainly not going to be anywhere near 20%. Okay, let's get to the last couple of games. Philly and San Francisco here. Uh, Bailey Falter on the mound. Uh, I think it's Bailey Falter. We'll see. Um, yeah, we'll see. They haven't officially announced what uh, what they're going to do. It's been reported that they were going to use him behind an opener because he's been awful in, in his first trip through the lineup. Uh, no strikeouts here. The velocity is down. Strikeout stuff way down. Uh, swinging strike stuff is put 8% now, so this makes him very attackable, really with both sides of the plate. You can play lefties against him too, and as, as you can see in this short, super noisy sample, still giving up a little bit of power here uh, at a 214 ISO. 162 ISO to the righties, 124 hitters, not as short a sample. 265 average to them, 320 Woba. So very attackable here with a an aggregate 17% K rate. Uh, and down velocity. He's basically just a soft toss and lefty anymore. And without a plus change up here and really marginal value on the on the fastball mix, four seamer and the and the two seamer, um, he's gonna give it up to right handers. And this is kind of Bailey Falter regressing a little bit back to what he has been uh, over his uh, over his career. So uh, just gives it up to righties, gives up some hard contact and some power. Buck 50 homers per nine to either side. So I think we can get to some giant stacks here if you want. Um, you can play some Tyro. He's 55 still, so pretty damn expensive. But he's he's been hitting very well this season. J.D. Davis, 3,800. Uh, Jock dealing with a little bit of a hand. He got hit when he was trying to bunt for some freaking reason. Uh, Mitch Hanniger's 3,300, though. I love this price for him. This is a really good spot. And uh, you can play like a Casey Schmidt, who's also very cheap and ha has had an excellent initial week in the in the big leagues so uh, Joey Bart behind the plate he's 23 you can get to some very cheap giant stacks here from the right side and attack Bailey Falter even if it's not him that uh, that starts the game uh, he'll very likely come in as the bulk reliever where he throws four or five innings or whatever and he'll get a full time through the lineup uh, at at the very least Austin Slater is out so we'll have to see what they want to do with like a Bryce Johnson who they just called back up uh, he's got a lot of speed. He's the stone minimum. You can mix him in in stacks, uh, but don't expect him to like hit a ball out or anything like that. So giant stacks are very much in play here. Um, are Philly stacks in play? I don't know. They're kind of expensive, and I don't really want to go after Alex Wood a lot of the time. Uh, but he might only get two or three innings here. I'm not sure he's fully stretched out. Um, and at 7,100, I don't think this is a playable price. Do we want to attack him? Uh, he's historically had a pretty decent change. But so far this year, in a super short sample, just 11 innings, we can't really take a lot out of, out of this. Uh, having a little bit of trouble throwing or spotting the the sinker and establishing. So he's just a three-pitch guy, and with the slider, it makes him usually pretty damn good against the left side. So that kind of takes out Bryce Harper at a full 59, Schwarber at 51 still. Uh, I mean, you can play Harper literally every day against everybody, it doesn't matter, but 59 is 59, and, you know, that's an expensive price tag for sure. Uh, Trey is still at 52. He's playable. JTR, 52, playable as well. Not great. Nick Castellanos, 49. This is a super off-the-board late-night tournament stack if you want to do that. Get to, like, a three-man or something. I think it's perfectly reasonable. Um, I do like Trey Turner a little bit here. I think it's an intriguing spot for him at 52, but uh, not jacked about playing a, a Sosa or an Alec Bohm or anything. I don't think we need to get that deep tonight necessarily, but uh, you could play some of the Phillies over here and, and target some Alex Wood. He's historically been a little bit worse to the right side, gives up a little bit more contact and a little bit more power. So very attackable, If certainly if he's only going to go two or three innings. Way down the list, though, in terms of 
uh, favorite stacks. Okay, last game here, Minnesota and the Dodgers going a little long here. 10-1 um, on the mound for Pablo. I think you can play this in tournaments, to be quite honest. 7% uh, ownership, I like this a lot. Uh, his K rate is spiked above 30%. This is like a 9% increase to where his numbers were last year. This is fantastic, and it's the sweeper. Um, it doesn't show up here because I'm pulling in data from a specific source. It's just This is from Pitch Info, and they don't uh, adjust for the sweeper just yet. But um, it is still categorized as a slider. Historically, a slider is you know, just a, a straight slider, I, I suppose, uh, if you want to term it that way has been, you know, much worse, but the value is coming way up for the sweeper itself. So, um, you know, that said, early going here, the numbers are just fantastic for Pablo. Had uh, one or even two starts where he got kind of picked apart a little bit, gave up a little bit of production. Um, yeah, two starts against Washington and Kansas City where they got to him a little bit and was just kind of not spotting it. One of those games, I believe, was like 38 degrees or something. Could have been the Washington start. Um, next one was against the Royals. They got him for six in six six runs in, in six innings. He still struck out seven, though, so it's not the strikeout stuff that is the problem. And that keeps his upside very high and his floor very high because even if he does give up runs, you know, he gave up six earned runs in that Royals start, went six innings, still scored 14 DK points because he eat the win out of it, right? So there there's still a floor here, and that's the closest thing you're going to get to uh, – a raw floor for anybody in baseball, it's pitcher strikeouts. And 31% K rate this season, this is legit. Um, the swing strike, strike, swinging strike rate rather, is pushing 15% here. And this is an elite figure, 70% nearly strike one. Uh, the chase is up at 36%. Per, I mean, it, it's insane, the transformation in Pablo's arsenal here. So I think this makes him very playable in tournaments tonight, even though he gets the Dodgers. Very good offense. It just got J.D. Martinez back. Um, you know, but it's still the plus side of Pablo's split here uh, in terms of the raw platoon. And, and J.D. Martinez, even though he hits both lefties and righties very well, we traditionally liked him a bit more against lefties. Uh, you can play the Dodgers for sure. Because Pablo historically has had a little bit of trouble with left-handers and neutralizing power there. But the change of yielding, like, that's been his best pitch so far. So, uh, in addition to the sweeper. So, it, it, I think both sides are playable here. If you want to play the Dodgers, you can play them literally every single day. Uh, you got to pay for them. 54 for Mookie is fine. 51 for Freddie is fine. 54 for Will Smith in this particular matchup, probably not. Max Muncy, I think, is going to strike out a little bit here. Uh, at 5,000, not super thrilled about that either. JD at 46, a little bit better. James Altman, 43, yeah, fine. Cheaper guys down at the bottom of the lineup now that they've moved Jason Hayward out of the four hole. Um, so I think Dodger stacks are reasonable. They're pretty well down the list, I think, for me. Not popping here in, in value or ownership so far. So nobody's going to be playing them. Um, I think I'd prefer to get to some Pablo pieces here at very low ownership. If this changes, it, it won't throughout the day, but um, then it would put me more onto the Dodgers because this is a three-true outcome team, man. 24% K rate, they're going to strike out, but they're going to hit for a lot of power. 219 ISO, 33% hard contact, and a 12% aggregate walk rate. 119 WRC+. plus. So they get on base and they create. Um, I think that's going to be a little bit more difficult here against Pablo, and he's a good tournament pivot off of Framber if you need... If you can't get all the way up there or if you need to uh, make an ownership play or something like that, this is a damn good tournament play, I think. Uh, it might not get there, and he might make me look like an idiot. Or the Dodgers might make me look like an idiot. Um, but I think it's a pretty high upside spot, even though it's uh, you know, pretty variant, I would say. I'm not touching no Cinder Guard, though. 6,900. He just doesn't have any strikeout stuff. Came out of his last start with a cut on his hand. Who knows if that's still around? But no matter, I mean, the velocity is down this year compared to where it was last year uh, by about a tick and a half. Um, strikeout rates are down about two and three ticks here. Uh, he's still throwing a lot of strikes, but he's he's sacrificing the raw K stuff. Uh, he just doesn't throw it past anybody. So I'm not playing him against the Twins. Twins are heating up a lot. They put up, uh, I believe, double-digit runs in back-to-back -back games uh, over the weekend. So guys, including Joey Gallo, who I totally despise because he strikes out, you know, like against me. Um, it, like, 
he's been markedly better in making a lot of contact. They're doing this Joey Gallo in the leadoff nonsense. Uh, and this is a good matchup for him because Syndergaard's not going to throw it past him. So, yeah, give me some Joey Gallo. He did come out of the game, I believe, with like a groin or, you know, tweak, to, tweak something. So you got to keep an eye on that. But you can get to Kirilov. He's still cheap. Has all the power in the world, 2,800. High upside power prospect for them as well. Um, getting, I guess, his second full year in the big leagues. Correa is at 45. You can play him. Buxton, finally, he gets somebody that's not going to strike him out. Um, his plate discipline is terrible, but and he's not running. So it, it makes him a little bit more difficult to play, but he's 5,200. You can play him here. Georgie Polanco, 45. Prices come down a little bit. That's fine. Trevor Larnick back in the big leagues, 3,200. Uh, I like this spot for him as well because his main problem is braking stuff and, and off-speed stuff, and Syndergaard doesn't have any of that. Um, maybe he'll get to him with the changeup, but you know we'll see. Overall, very low whiff stuff from Syndergaard in general, so good spot for Trevor Larnick, too. So you can play pretty much everybody in the Twins. I think he's a really, really good late tournament stack as well. And full correlations with Pablo Lopez. I think these are very playable here. Um, I generally don't... I mean, I like stacking against Syndergaard because he pitches so much contact, and I think he stinks. But it, he's kind of sometimes... Uh, difficult to stack against because he can induce a little bit of soft contact and keep the baseball on the ground sometimes. But overall, the aggregate numbers is like, they're very attackable. Um, so I like the twins here a little bit. I think you can, I mean, you're getting evens on them in the market right now. And despite this being the Dodgers in a, in a late game, uh, you're getting a pretty good price there. So I think it's a, a reasonable punt in the betting markets and in DFS. Uh, okay, so that's it. For the breakdown, went a little bit long here. Um, let's quickly go over stacks. Yankees, Toronto, mostly just offense here. I don't want to deal with the Manoa shenanigans. Uh, I think it is going to be Brito behind an opener. That was announced while I was going through the, the games here today. So um, that is who Jimmy Cordero is just going to open. Probably going to be Brito coming out of the bullpen uh, after that, but I still like offense. Uh, Seattle and Boston, yeah, offense, sure, but I think you can play some shrewd tournament pieces of either Kirby or Tanner Houck here. Uh, Milwaukee and St. Louis, um, give me Milwaukee, definitely. Some Freddie pieces, sure, maybe a couple of St. Louis teams, but pretty well down the list, I think, but zero Flaherty. I don't I don't want to deal with him. Uh, Atlanta and Texas, Atlanta definitely against the young lefty coming up, making his debut. Uh, Texas, of course, as well. Charlie Morton's going to be pretty popular today, and Texas is a damn good lineup. You can get a good bit of leverage, I think. Um, Cubs and Houston, probably just Houston, I think against Tyon, but if you land on a 7,500 Tyon, it's not horrible. Uh, Framber for sure against the Cubs. I don't want any of the Cubs. Um, Cincinnati and Colorado offense only for the most part. You can play some Hunter Green though. 8,300 is a fine price tag. He has upside there, uh, in this particular matchup. Arizona and Oakland. You can play Oakland as well against Merrill Kelly, get some leverage teams here. You can certainly play Merrill, definitely, and a lot of Arizona, of course, against Ruzinski. Um, but you could mix in a couple of Oakland pieces. That's not super crazy. KC and San Diego, um, no no pitching here for me at all, I don't think. Uh, offense only. San Diego, definitely. Maybe some Royals pieces as well. I'm not sold on, uh, on Michael Walker. Philly and San Francisco, late tournament stacks. Not uh, like I'm not intrigued about pitching at all. Um, here and really kind of off of offense too a little bit. Maybe some Giants. Minnesota though I, I do like a good bit and some Pablo on the mound. No Cindergard. Maybe some Dodgers. Uh, that's pretty much it. So let's get out of here. It's been a kind of a long one here today. Sorry about that. But uh, that's um. So we're all done. DK projections and ownership loaded to the site. Once again, keep an eye out for updates as always. And good luck to everybody on Monday's main.